Good evening. Thank you very much for joining us on Revelation TV's Bible Study. It's one of the most popular programs on Revelation TV, if not across the whole, if I dare say, of the Christian uh, channels, especially in the UK. We've got some stats to prove it, just in case you don't believe us. But anyway, it doesn't really matter because the thing is, it's a fact. One of those things that happens. There's nothing more important than understanding the Word of God. And I'm so blessed to have been 10 years in the making of having people who are able to not only, I suppose, ex be exponents of those wonderful words that were written thousands of years ago, born along by the Holy Spirit, my add, 66 books in total, all in harmony with each other. Now, I'm sure some of you might argue those particular uh, points uh, that there is apparent contradictions, but I say apparent contradictions because there are answers to this. But I do want to say to you tonight is a very special night because we have a special guest, Philip Day. Philip Day, welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Anne. It's great to be here. Uh, and I, I've got to say that you're an author and also the founder of... Uh, the Campaign for Truth in Medicine. I'm glad you put it so yes. succinctly. Beautiful. Sounds very noble, but actually it's uh, hard work, hard work, yeah. Nothing's easy in ministry. Well, it's, um, it's all about helping people and it's all about trying to get the truth out uh, for when people are in trouble, they need people to listen to them, they need people to talk to, and that's what we do, so, yeah. Truth in medicine, now, can I just, before I introduce uh, Tim, just tell me a little bit about what you mean by truth in medicine, why that in connection with the Bible? Well, if we look at what's going on in Britain today, we've got a catastrophe going on with the National Health Service. We've just seen uh, some really disquieting headlines coming out. 42,000 people last year uh, died of dehydration in National Health Service hospitals. And uh, for a long time, people have known that the, that the entire health system is collapsing. We've got all kinds of problems with A&E. And my organization represents the citizen. So our job really, I mean, we're paying for this. So our job is to see what we can do to help out, but also to see what we can do ourselves in order to avoid getting sick in the first place. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a wonderful message because when people start taking responsibility for their actions with their health, that seems to filter down through all parts of their life as well. And, uh, you know, we see some, some amazing recoveries from people who just start living differently. Where do you base or where do you get most of your uh, wisdom from? Well, all of it's coming out of the scientific journals. And uh, we're plugged into hundreds of doctors around the world, so we get a lot of clinical feedback going on uh, about this as well. But none of this is, all of this is public information that's been uh, brought out in the scientific journals. But it hasn't been given the emphasis uh, that it really should. And so. We now see a lot of famous figures coming out, we can talk about that later on, you know, who've, who've got a lot to say about the health challenges that they've met and how they've been able to overcome them. And we need doctors. It's very important to understand this is, this is not an anti-doctor message at all. I've got doctors in the family. <laughs> um, but it's important to understand that it's not a doctor's job for you not to get sick. That's our job. And what we should be doing is making sure that we're just, there's some simple things we can do that can really avoid a whole amount of hurt. And yeah, we're all about letting people know what those things are. So stay tuned to Revelation TV, not just for this hour uh, of Bible study, but also for the following and suing hour, which we will be going into more detail and taking your calls. Yes, phone calls, live phone calls. We'll go into that later as I explain how to take part in that. But obviously, emails and texts we'll deal with probably the latter part of this uh, first hour. and. Uh, Tim Vince, as you may know, of course, very familiar face on Bible study. Thank you for joining us Thank tonight you. in Spain. Thank you very much. And I not just tonight. I heard Philip speak <laughs> in Margate, of all places, about. Well, I was trying works. to work out about 15, 16 years ago when I had skin cancer. And someone said, you must go and he's a really, really good speak. And he was quite entertaining. It was like going <laughs> home, because I used to go to school down there yeah. in Thanet. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. That's where we hail from. Now, um, You've alluded so far to mention uh, Bible. What's the Bible got to do with health and happiness? Well, it's, number one, it's the manufacturer's handbook. And right from an early age, uh, when I was growing up, of course, I, di I, didn't, I had a very sort of, oh, well, they're teaching me the Bible, so I better just do what they say. But over the years, uh, it's a pretty astonishing document when you get in there. And I think one of the uh, proofs for divine inspiration of the Bible is quite simply the information in there that we're only now starting to realize. Uh, is exactly as, as laid out. And in my book Origins, 
I was able to lay out just, just chapter after chapter of scientific information that's contained in the Bible and how we're only now just starting to find out that this is the case. Um, there's a lovely passage, I believe, in Job where it talks about the Pleiades being gravitationally bound. I spoke to a prof professor in, uh, in uh, MIT and I said, how long have we known that the Pleiades, you know, the planets that make up the Pleiades are gravitationally bound? She said, just in a matter of years, just a few years we've known about that and yet there it is going back Lovely all that time, Job. thousands of years ago. Yeah. Talks yeah. about the pillars of the earth, doesn't it, in there? Yep. Talks about uh, a spherical earth. Um, there's the water cycle is mentioned in there as well. Uh, there's a lot of, um, in Revelation, there's that chapter, there's that, um, I think it's chapter 11, where the, um, you have the two witnesses are killed in the street and their dead bodies are left in the street. It says all, of the, all the peoples of the earth look upon their dead bodies, not possible without satellite TV. And so there's lots of insights that you can get with uh, things that are mentioned in there. But for health, it's an absolute treasure trove. Just to set the scene, because I know you, you probably already lost two or three people, or even thousands, <laughs> who are tuned in who say, hang on a sec, this guy's talking about creation, the origins thereof. Um, what's your educational background? Well, I was lucky to go through one of the best educational systems uh, England has to offer. I went to Charterhouse, and um, I was trained in evolution. Uh, I came top in evolution, and anthropology, and biology. And so I learned all about the Big Bang and um, accepted it. But even back then, uh, I had a problem with it. And I'll never forget going down to Charterhouse Library one lunchtime. And there was a National Geographic article that was dealing with the five billionth person who'd just been born on the planet. And all of a sudden, it's like I had my Oprah moment. And I thought, hang on a minute. If we've been around for literally hundreds of thousands of years evolving, how come we've only got five, five, uh, five billion people on the planet, if you do the math? there should be a huge amount of people on the planet. And the fact that we've only got five billion raised uh, a real problem for me. And that was really the start of me looking more into this. Uh, when Origins came out, it created an awful lot of trouble in science circles because people are having their paradigms challenged. We know about DNA now. We know that DNA is a three out of four error correcting digital code with stop and start bits. I mean, this is, a, this is an absolute, when Crick and Watson saw it, they were s astonished and the implications of DNA alone and the cell. See, back when Darwin was writing his Origin of the Species, the cell was thought to be something very simple. We now know, coming out of World War II, the cell is immensely complicated and simply could not come around um, by these undirected processes. So the Bible has been an absolute uh, journey. It's been absolutely marvelous to go through uh, seeing what's put down there. And the health information, as I said, is absolutely uh, uh, fabulous. Let's. Because, believe it or not, this is a Bible study, and we're going to get into it. Uh, Philip uh, actually has tremendous knowledge and information uh, which he's gleaned over the years uh, from the scriptures about how we can avoid getting uh, sicker than sick. You know, one of the things that we saw over the weekend was 24 hours in A&E, which Sky were doing. Uh, I, th I think it's, it's really good that they actually did that because we could see that the, the the people in the street were saying, well, hang on a sec, those that sort of self-inflict uh, their own um, health problems should be paying for it mm -hmm. rather than others who are, you know, looking after themselves. But you could talk about that with regards to whether they're smoking or drinking or taking drugs, that perhaps they should uh, contribute uh, to a greater degree. But then you could add to that, what about people who are not eating properly or n eating correctly as you know, originally uh, put forth uh, in the scripture. Now, some people would say, hang on a sec, we're not interested. We don't even accept there is a God. We're not even ex going to accept that there are scriptures or writings, ancient writings that we should live by. Mm. So give us a, a little bit of an overview, um, perhaps even introducing the scriptures that we'd actually be talking about and basing our study tonight, mm. um, that connecting health uh, and how to keep on the healthy side, literally to avoid some of the major sicknesses of our day and age, i.e. cancer. Well, when I first started researching health uh, 30 years ago, one of, the, one of the key things you do as a researcher going into a, a subject like this is you stand back and you look at the whole playing field. And the first thing you notice is that what was killing us 150 years ago isn't what's killing us today. Back, if you go back to 1840, 1850, it's TB, smallpox, cholera, diphtheria, 
those types of diseases, the dirt diseases. Well, we saw those starting to get cleared up with the social um, programs that were implemented in the 1850s when we began piping the sewage in the street. And then you get to around 1880, 1890, and we see another group of diseases coming in at this point, um, which are what we call the metabolic deficiency diseases. So, rickets. Well, these would be, yeah, it would include rickets, but it would be heart disease. The ones that we're familiar with today, which would be heart disease, cancer, stroke, and of course, pulmonary lung disorders, diabetes. It's interesting, Alzheimer's, why did they call it Alzheimer's? In fact, it was dated after Dr. Alois Alzheimer's in 1906. And so my question is, why didn't they call that King Canute's disease? Right? Why didn't they call it Shakespeare's disease? I mean, it, it's, it happens there. So it's a 20th century problem. And so's motor neuron disease. They called it Lou Gehrig's disease. I haven't found one Brit in 50 who knows who Lou Gehrig was, but he was the David Beckham of the 1930s with baseball player. And he ended up with motor neuron disease, so they named the disease after him. So my question is, why didn't they call that William the Conqueror's disease? Because it wasn't relevant back then. This, this is dating it to the 20th century. So what we see is that the, we're starting to do things differently. Moving into the 20th century, we have the processing of food, and we start to see the uh, commercial processing of uh, bread. Now, here's a fascinating one, because Jesus said, I am the bread of life. But now we've got today bread making people ill and the bread that we've got today bears no relation whatsoever to the bread of the ancients. And we can get onto some of the problems there, but a lot of the viewers um, uh, are having problems processing bread. I mean, I was looking at Dr. Tom O'Brien, who reckons about 70% of people are having some sort of a toxic reaction to gluten. And the bread as we make it today is entirely different from how it was made back in uh, our Lord's day. Well, we have somebody here in the studio, uh, Lorna, Gordon's wife, uh, who is uh, a sufferer, can't eat anything yeah. that has the gluten. Well, the top of the pyramid, you get celiac, and then the, the pyramid mm -hmm. seems to come down from there. So people are having toxic reactions which are not necessarily celiac, and we can maybe get on to find out what the problems are and why, you know, and what we can do to put them right. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the scriptures, because it is a Bible study of sorts. Um, please bear with us, because this is important information. Trust me, you know, it's no good just reading scriptures and sort of saying just for the sake of it. We need to know what's relevant to our day. And we're living in a day where there are more and more people becoming sick. Uh, and a lot of it uh, could be avoided. Not say we're going to completely um, annihilate or get rid of cancer. But certainly if you want to do the best you can and look at the creator, what he is saying in his manual. Uh, and we would refer you to tonight, the book of Daniel. Um, something written probably 600 years BC. Are we talking about that sort of period? Uh, yeah, in the 6th uh, century. Mm. century BC. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, Tim, if you'd read from chapter 1, verse 5 through I've to... I've put my Bible down, I thought I was going to just listen 16. to it. Oh, no, it's me that's going to read it, sorry. Exactly. You know the reason is because I'm sitting right in here, sorry. Uh, here we go. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now let me just set the scene here before we go on. Sorry, do this. Uh, Daniel was one of those uh, that were taken captivity from Israel, uh, or from Jerusalem in particular, to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar or Belshazzar, whatever you want to call him. And uh, there was three of them uh, as well, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego on top of uh, Daniel. Known for their wisdom, the, the wise king of Babylon, even though these were people that were taken into captivity, were brought into the court eventually of the king because of their wisdom and understanding. And it was something that, it was a wisdom that came from the living God. But there was something special about Daniel and he had an opportunity to really set his testimony before the king when it came down to the Jewish diet. And let's carry on with the following verse. Uh, now from among, from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them the chief of the eunuchs uh, gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshech, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God has brought Daniel into the favour and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, 
I fear my lord the king, who has appointed your food and drink, for why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. So Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies and you see fit, so deal with your servants. So he consented with them in this matter and tested them for ten days. And at the end of the ten days their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus the steward took away their portion of delicacies and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. So what is that, what is that <laughs> telling us? It's not, as most people might think, preaching vegetarianism. There's actually a very, very interesting message in here. Um, boy, where to start? To me, uh, we know all about these t the, the Daniel chapter 1 diet as the diet that we use for people who have heart disease and uh, cancer. Bill Clinton, uh, you might remember last time we met, Bill Clinton, uh, people can go on YouTube and do a search on Bill Clinton and Wolf Blitzer and diet, yeah, yeah, just put that up and it'll pull up an interview with this ex-president of the United States who had clogged up arteries and he'd had a bypass and the bypasses were clogging up thank goodness he could take the stent but he knew he was in trouble and he'd done some research and he'd found out that if you went onto that diet then according to research 82% of the people who had adopted a plant-based diet uncooked uh, would clear themselves out and on that interview it's interesting because they get the two of these top doctors Cordell Esselstyn and Dr. Dean Ornish to explain that this is exactly how they do it. Dean Ornish has forged an incredible reputation for himself of being able to deal with serious cardiovascular disease um, with diet with no surgical intervention which is which is remarkable. So there is a track record and it's, it's you know very scientific and it's all been looked at uh, that these diets do this. But I think one of the most important points that's coming out of this pas passage in Daniel is about the counterfeit because we know the enemy counterfeits all the ways of God right and so if you think about it all the way through you've got the true Passover and then you've got the pagan Easter you've got Christ and you've got Xmas where X marks the spot where Christ used to be you've got <laughs> God's love and man's lust you see you've got the the the, the oh, true God's true. ways and then the counterfeit you've got God's wisdom man's pride and then you've got God's food and then you've got man's alternative. So today, you walk into a supermarket today and have a good look around and you're going to see that 80 to 90 percent of that supermarket is man manufactured food. Man food, not God's food. And one of the points, you can read a lot into those, those verses that mm. you've Even just read. Even in their names, by the way. You've got the names that have meaning in the Hebrew and then the counterfeit, which is the Babylonian names right. that were imposed on yeah. them. So I think what we're looking at here is I think Daniel's making a point that he's going to go with God's food not man's food because you can imagine the type of things that were being served well, that up was in going Nebuchadnezzar. Well be my next question. What sort of things are the king's delicacies? Because we know from afar when sometimes we visit you know Far Eastern uh, countries that will be perhaps um, set before us some things that we sh would normally just reject uh, sheep's eyeballs or testicles yeah. or whatever you want to name offal etc well I'd like to make a, a, an observation here that um, every single night we turn on the TV and there's some celebrity chef showing us more inventive ways of murdering our food and notice it's not about nutrition I'm not gonna no names no names it's about presentation it's about how can we marinate an aardvark in bay leaves in our Jimmy Chews with our little fingers in the air, right? So nothing to do with nutrition. So there's a whole counterfeit thing going on. And by the way, this is set between Daniel and his friends who came out of Jerusalem. See, the Bible is very much uh, uh, a tale of two cities. You have Jerusalem, which is the true, and then you have Babylon, which is the counterfeit. Jerusalem is the city of God, Babylon is the city of man. And there's a lot of connotations there to the end time. To, yeah, uh, I mean, Nebuchadnezzar, if you like, represents the God of this world. He was, he was, he was the ruler of the world at that time. Mm -hmm. 
And he was very new because um, not 20, 30 years previously, Babylon was actually a province of the Assyrian Empire, which Nebuchadnezzar's dad, Nabopolassar, had actually totally destroyed and then died. And uh, so Nebuchadnezzar, as a young man, took over this amazing new empire. So you have, you have, to me, this whole thing talks about, there's, there's a lot of nutrition in there, but to me it's, it's this lovely insight into um, the, the true way and then the counterfeit. And what I say to people is this, that we now know that 80% of the population in the Western cultures commences committing suicide by lifestyle from around age 12. So we start doing, we start eating stuff that we've not been told is gonna do us in and we are the victims of unintended consequences. But if we go and change that and just change a few simple things, there was a doctor who got all up in arms the other day uh, because he said, guys, hospital is the, um, the center of medical learning. And yet, guess what's in the food court? And there's a fast food restaurant that we all know about in the food court. Yeah. I said, well, that's nothing because you go out to Cambridge, you've got Addenbrooke's, which is the center of cardiology. And guess what's in their food court? Not another fast food. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> So we're not, the point is, we're not failing on a complicated level here. <laughs> really, are we? No. But so just to draw a parallel from yesterday, uh, yesteryear and today, what would be the equivalent of the king's delicacies today? Because the thing is that what was interesting was Daniel put a test and I mean, he took his life in his hands to actually propose that he didn't take part in the king's delicacies because it would have been an affront uh, rude, if you like, yeah. uh, to the king uh, presenting all this lovely food. So today, w uh, or even then, when he said, look, just give us 10 days, or something like that, wasn't it? And if my countenance is better than the countenance of those who are eating the king's delicacies, then there I, I rest my case. Well, I would say that my answer to that would be that the kind of the delicate, the, the sort of delicacies you would have seen in Nebuchadnezzar's court would have been very high on presentation, as Tim said, very high on presentation, zero on nutrition. And then you have Daniel selecting vegetables which have no form or comeliness that we might design them. Mm. And yet those are the things in the end that are going to sustain you and make more of you. And even today, you know, I mean, when I, if I turn on the TV and we see one of these cooking programs where everyone's swearing at everyone else and getting all upset, and then finally you see the end product, it's not about nutrition. So it's, it's, it's this counterfeit again. It's this whole idea of presentation over awing the actual functionality of what we should be eating so we don't die terribly. I mean, you think about that. You think about a loved one who dies and you've got to put on a suit and there's a funeral and there's weeping and there's horror and there's kids wondering what's going on, all because of wrong choices. Right, but we're, I, I think we're becoming more and more educated throughout the, the recent months and years uh, as to what the food is doing to us, like we learned over the years that smoking kills. Are we saying that all food that is processed or particular foods are killing us, literally? Well, we've now got a situation where the supermarkets in the UK have now lifted the ban on selling meats which were fed genetically modified hmm. feed. So now... I didn't know that. Yeah, that's, mm. that happened about two or three months ago. So now we've got food that's coming in that is, has been corrupted in a way that we have no clue about. So we don't know about the end. We don't know about the butterfly effect of how these foods work. We've got um, some pretty good ideas about some of the horror stories coming out of India uh, where the, these types of foods have been eaten and also out of America we have a new disease called Morgellons disease which is a disease where it feels like you have insects crawling under your skin um, and we don't know what is the heart of that could be nanotechnology we have no idea but the whole when you understand about how when you understand about the DNA RNA transcription process in other words how you eat food and how food becomes you the idea that you're now going to start introducing man-centered foods is, uh, in my view, just treasuring up Roth because we have no clue about the end result of all of this. So this is just man playing it's God. It's all part of, yeah, playing God, this the is arrogance. Taking over the, taking over the creation. Trying to monopolize yeah. the patent on a, on a food, you know, basic food stuff. One of, our, one, of our, one of our top GMO companies, everyone knows the name of this company, has just patented human breast milk. Uh, I wonder how that's possible. Yeah, no idea. How you do this? We it's could amazing. perhaps ask our sponsor what he thinks yeah, about it. <laughs> but yeah, they're, they're basically patenting the creation. 
And worse than that, I mean, if people think that it's really all about fish, genes, and tomatoes, that's not what the end run is on this at all. Um, we now know, and this has been widely reported, that we have human-animal chimeras being produced in laboratories around the world. Mm -hmm. And this is going on. So where does that end? When we come back to the food side of it that you were talking about, Howard, when we come down to understanding how food works in the body, if you go back to basics with food, I know this personally because I had tremendous health problems coming out of my teens and my 20s, and I was able to eradicate them just in the space of four or five months, effortlessly, just by changing diet. And I've seen literally hundreds, if not thousands, of people do the same thing over the last 30 years. Hmm. Now, we want to save a lot of this for the second part uh, that follows the Bible study. Cause, uh, so I want to try and stick with as many scriptures as we can at the moment, because it's so easy to divert uh, our attention to. I, I think it's a more fascinating subject, to, not to put the Bible down, but because it actually upholds what the Bible says with regards to what sort of foods are good for us and why. And we can go back to Genesis, can't we, chapter 1, the seed. Yeah. Uh, do you want to give us yeah. the, the lowdown on that? Because this is fascinating mm. stuff. Yeah, I mean, Genesis 1, 28, 29, God says, eat the seeds of the common fruits. And we now know that seeds have got a tremendous anti-cancer potential. And this has been known for... 80 years or so. And we see animals do this. I mean, if you, uh, you see the way the birds will pick open and eat seeds, um, seeds themselves have a tremendous uh, 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 progeny effect in terms of health. We also see coming down through the Exodus where Moses, who was trained in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and you know what the wisdom of the Egyptians, if you look at their medicine cabinet, included the most appalling things you can possibly imagine. And yet, none of this makes it into the Bible. Have you noticed that? None of the so-called wisdom of the Egyptians makes it into the Bible. And so what we see are these laws that are coming out, um, uh, just uh, common sense and scientifically proven as time goes by. What do you think Daniel's trying to prove here? That God's laws or God's understanding uh, for what we should be eating is correct for us and that what we uh, or as Babylon saw as being fit for human consumption uh, was not as good for them. Could it be, could it be actually a put down to Nebuchadnezzar? Yeah but well, that's what was dangerous wasn't it really? Yeah. For him to but put, Nebuchadnezzar put is in the, t if you look at this in terms through the Jewish prophetic eyes, this is a type isn't it? Mm -hmm. You've got Jerusalem which is the city of God, Secular Babylon world. is the city of man and Nebuchadnezzar is a uh, representative of the God of this world, all right? And here you have Daniel basically saying, this is what God says, and I'm going to reject what the world system is offering me, and I'm going to stay with this, and you're going to see that that's the way to go. And that's exactly what they see over 10 days. 10 days... Of which uh, Nebuchadnezzar saw later on in his life. Uh, and Daniel's name, God is my judge, I, I find that very powerful. Yeah. So you're not my judge. God is the judge. And I'll tell you something else. How long did that experiment go on for? Ten days, was it? Yeah, ten is the number of the law. Oh, yeah. Complete. Yeah. As well. Yeah. Yeah. So, but going back to Scripture, what, what else can we glean from Scriptures uh, uh, that would help people to, un you know, s s tie this in with a Bible study so it's not just a nutrition program? Well, food is, is um, you know, we have fasting in the Bible. Food is very, very important. I mean, every time we see Jesus, uh, we don't ever see Jesus without him uh, eating. You know, you always see, you know, not only um, after his resurrection. In fact, every time you see him after the resurrection, he's actually eating, isn't he? Um, but I think one of the most important things about food is food is, if we see how God nourished the Israelites during the 38 years after, um, after Kadesh Barnea, when they refused to go into the land, and so God says, right, you're going to wander around till every one of you over 20 who defy me drops. And yet he provides for them. And he provides for them in a way. Um, you know, I would imagine after 38 years of eating uh, panna cotta and manna, manna burgers, manna pizza, and just about anything Even to do for with... for a week. <laughs> for for a week. So you get uh, some quails. With the odd quails thrown. Yeah. <laughs> the odd quails being thrown wow, into the mix as meat. well. But um, again... Uh, I, I keep coming back to this whole no formal comeliness that we should desire it. I mean, we have become so worshipping of food. And, you know, you look at these restaurants. I was reading about a restaurant today where they charge 70p for a chip. And here's God saying, no, no, it's the simple things. It's almost the foolishness of God over, over ours. And that's what I see also there. Not the vegetables are foolish, but it's, all, it's almost like God's making a point here that the mm. foolishness of God over ours, the greatest wisdom of the God of this world represented by Nebuchadnezzar. I guess you could read that into it mm. too. 
Okay, so what uh, if there's any emails and things coming in as well? Uh, yeah, Tim. there are. There are. Throw, 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 throw some of those into yeah. the mix. Yeah, Norma just writes, thanks for tonight. Have just come out of hospital where medication and chemicals in our environment causing are causing heart problems and serious allergic reactions. Yet when they stopped treating me, um, they could find my pulse again. Now I am on no meds heart rate. Great. BP still too low. Managed by special bed head lower than legs. Seriously thinking of taking our God's word to improve the health I have left. Thank you for giving me food for thought. Play on words there. <laughs> do you have a book out with something like that? I do. I, I mean, there's something about, <laughs> there is something about chemicals, though, because the, the, the evolutionary worldview is that we just, we just evolved from chemicals. So all you need to do is treat the human frame with chemicals. Have you, have you read um, Stephen Hawking's book, The Grand Design, no. where he basically says mind doesn't exist and you're nothing but a bunch of sparking chemicals? Uh, uh, operating you in a machine-like deterministic way. Yeah. I find this really interesting because next Valentine's Day I'm going to say to my wife, um, Samantha, I've saved up £3,000 to take on a beautiful holiday because I love you like crazy. But according to Stephen Hawking, love is just chemicals, so sorry. He does contradict himself. Though. If you read his books, the follow-on books to the, the Brief History of Time, and, and I've heard him say that through the machine that he is just like a computer. He didn't mention chemicals and he said, that, well, I'll just be switched off one day right. which is just so sad and another question can I just throw in one yeah, and no, that no. is you know down in Margate are there's the there's quite a, a famous story of, of a Christian doctor who got brought up by the GMC over praying with his patients I don't know if you heard yeah, of it. Heard Richard of Scott yes. Yes. my neighbor yes. um, but the the fact is that in the World Health Organization they say that you must deal with the the, the physical, the mental, and the spiritual needs. And I was going to ask where, where does spirituality come in? It doesn't it, anymore. Because one of the... One of the where does it come in in what you are offering as an alternative? Oh, I see what you're yeah. saying. Um, spirituality, we're part software and part hardware. Um, I had this fascinating lunch one day with a um, medical professor out of UCLA when I was living in Los Angeles. And... Um, I took him to the Cheesecake Factory because I needed to oil him up a bit because I wanted him to talk. And he said, well, the problem with medicine is we just don't appreciate that humans are part software and part hardware. I went, oh, well, that's interesting. Mm. So, you know, there is this reckon, even though they're Descartes and evolutionary trained biochemists, doctors or pharmacologists, if you like, they do appreciate that there is this other side. There's this whole spiritual software component to the human and they don't know what to do with it. So the whole thing is passed over to the psychiatrist or the theologian, you know, so... Um, but I think it's very important that mentally people take responsibility for their actions, obviously, you know, in, in their day-to-day -day doings, but also in terms of how they're feeding themselves and their families. Hmm. I have a five-year-old daughter. She's five now. I have a five-year-old daughter, <laughs> and to her, food is a jammy dodger. In the <laughs> Philip Day household, yeah. food is a jammy dodger. Yeah. So I've got this uphill battle now, and I know I'm not alone. I know Who started her on them? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, she's got, she's, uh, she, has a, she has a more involved social schedule than Kim Kardashian because she's, <laughs> she's got 14 or 15, she's got 14 or 15 mates at school and they all have parties and guess what they serve up at the parties? Yeah. Jamie Dodgers. We've got a problem with your mic, so just a second. What I'm going to do, if you put up Genesis 1, 29 to 31, I'm going to read that scripture in Genesis. Also, we'll look at the, the dietary laws as well. So, um, which were given to uh, the Israelites in particular to start with. Let's have a look at Genesis 1, verse 29. Tim, would you, could you read that from there? Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's not my mic's the right way around. Yeah. And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be for food. And also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, in which there is life. I've given every green herb for food, and it was so. More? Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Okay. Now, Philip, uh, when you look at that, it looks very simplistic, and people would just say, oh, there's a book, fairy stories. Where does this lead us following those particular instructions or that, that uh, if you like, revelation that what God has set initially for us uh, to eat? Well, if you study the 
if you study the Eid, the Eid and the, pre, the pre-flood world, it was very, very different ecologically from the world we live in post-flood. And back then, apparently, everything was vegetarian and everything grew prolifically. And so scientists have had to come up with explanations based on what they find. There's some extraordinary discoveries being made of um, tropical forests down, deep down, about 300 feet down underneath the tundra in Alaska, um, which, of course, indicates that the pre-flood uh, world was incredibly different. But there seems to be, you notice that straight after the flood, we start to see the lifespans declining. And then we start the, with the introduction of meat eating. And uh, the dietary laws, of course, change at that point. And scientists are coming up with reasons why they think that was the case as well. But to me, uh, that just paints a picture pre-flood that here we had a, a perfect environment that was going bad very, very quickly uh, to the point where Noah was instructed to build a barge and keep it on his driveway for 120 years while he tried to, uh, uh, he tried to do the impossible and to get the wicked to, uh, to repent. Um, but I think when, knowing what we know now about the effects of plant foods on disease, um, it's, once again, to me, it's the foolishness of God overawing uh, the greatest wisdom of man. And for the last 30 years, I've seen the dead get up and walk. I've seen people who have no business even sucking air for another three weeks with a cancer diagnosis who are cancer-free today, and they have been for 15 to 20 years. And what do you attribute that to? What I attribute it to is I attribute it to a combination of God's blessing and people deciding to go back to basics and obey nature's laws. We know that the whole world is governed by natural laws, which if you break them, nature's going to sharpen her sword for you. And, you know, you can be as righteous as anything, but if you go up onto a 40-story building and jump off, um, you know, we're all subject to those same laws. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, the things that we've learned over the, uh, say, the last two or three hundred years in particular uh, are quite interesting. When we look at scripture and we look at the laws or the, if you like, the instructions that our creator gave us um, only coming to light uh, in, as I say, in recent years where we could see that there was wisdom there for us to be able to prolong life and have a, a good life. Uh, so where would you point to in scripture to actually help people who just switched on tonight and say, well, hang on a sec, you know, I'm interested in this. You know, are we under law? Are we still under those sort of laws? Or no, but what, what is the benefit if we were to apply them in our daily life? Well, of course, this is, uh, Paul gets into this whole thing in Romans. You know, what is the purpose of the law? The law is mm. to increase sin. The law is, is for us to know that we are absolutely desperately in need of a redeemer because the yardstick is just way too high. Um, when we look at it in terms of the 613 laws that are expounded in the Old Testament that make up um, the Mosaic law, uh, none of them are abrogated. They're still in effect. But what Christ came to do was to show us how we would live in the spirit of those laws. So nobody's going to judge anybody else. We're told, don't judge anybody in terms of what they eat. Or drink. Or drink. And, um, you know, all the time people will um, send me an email and say, well, you know, is it really, should I be vegetarian? Should I be meat eating? And the whole thing is, how do you feel? I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a vegetarian. I've got nothing against vegetarians. Some of my, my best meals have been vegetarians. I but, thought we were going to say friends then. <laughs> it's interesting in Romans uh, 14, where, where it's, uh, Paul alludes to the stronger uh, being those that are not vegetarian and the weaker being mm-hmm. vegetarian. Yeah, yeah, what, yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is. What, we, what I say to people is this, this, this plant-based approach that, that you see Daniel talking about um, in, uh, uh, in the first chapter that we've just looked at is a great tool. Um, to me, it's not a life sentence. There are people who choose to live that way all the time, and that's great. But to me, it's an incredible tool. If you've got somebody who's in trouble, for instance, we've seen clinics around the world that are using this particular... Uh, diet, in other words, plant-based, uncooked, to catapult people out of type 2 diabetes. And we've seen study after study showing this. Um, the Rave Diet crew, this is what they're all about. Those are those two doctors I was talking about who were dealing with um, President Clinton. So we know that it's a fantastic tool. And if we exercise wisdom and God's guidance with this, then there's all kinds of ways that we can get out of tough situations. And he wants us to do that. Do you think Daniel was... Uh, purely a vegetarian or do you, was he trying to just prove a point with that at that time with the kings opposing the king's delicacies or do you think that 
as uh, they were mainly farming communities in the, the times of Israel, early days, uh, that they would have been eating sheep, uh, goats, or, but certainly not pig, of course. Well, there's one word that gives it away, and that's he didn't want to defile himself with the king's delicacies. So obviously, so he doesn't pork. want to. Yeah, he doesn't want to defile himself with the world system. Is, is by, to me, it's a type. I mean, we're given, we're given some great nutritional information, but I wouldn't ever preach from that mm. to, send, to sell people the vegetarian and message. And it may be that the, the, the sort of pig meat was mixed with the other meats, so you wouldn't know which was which. I'm sure it was a real mess. Mm. And I'd think that if they had that on TV today, yeah. people would be going, no, probably not. Yeah. They used to outdo themselves with these things. I mean, when you get into the Roman era, I mean, they would absolutely outdo mm. uh, uh, the, the, there was this whole competition to see who could produce but the most revolting Isn't it yeah. interesting, the extreme came with Belshazzar's feet, feast. Yeah. Mm. And then the writing was on the wall and then the judgment came. And the same Daniel who was there as a boy, you know, is there to the judge yeah, the last yeah. emperor of, of yeah. the Babylonians. And you know, that Belshazzar feast is pretty interesting because that happened at a feast, at a, at a place of eating, and then the writing was on the wall. And, you know, you could, if, if you want to stretch it even more, just say that if you eat wrong, the writing's on the wall for mm. anybody who continues to break these natural laws. This was what... You want to know why I get so passionate about this? Because this was me. This was me in my late teens, early 20s, in deep trouble. Because I'd been through a great education, and I came out knowing nothing. Certainly not about how to make sure that I didn't die early from eating all the wrong things. So... To me, yeah, it's a type. It's a very good type. Well, there are things in our school systems today that are, are, are trying to improve uh, the dietary um, intake of, of those at school, particularly when we have such high levels of obesity in young children. So, uh, you know, we're starting to get educated. So what well, we are. We I think we've got to start with the hospitals. We've got to rip the kitchens out. We've got to get in there. Because you walk into any hospital at lunchtime, it's pretty clear that nobody's got the slightest clue what mm. food would do to the human body. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to start. I mean, I get do letters from doctors all the time. You're dead right. You want to see what I You're had for lunch. That's a good You're one, dead yeah. right. You want to see what I had for lunch today. <laughs> and, you know, how can you possibly make people better? But you see, it's this whole di this, this divorcing of the idea that... Um, yeah, food's good enough to keep you alive. You know, the most incredible, one doctor said to me, we're, we're taught to swallow the most incredible par paradox that food's apparently good enough to keep you alive and make every cell in your body, but it's not good enough to fix you when you're sick, mm. Mm. which is an intellectually inconsistent argument. Yeah. Well, uh, here we are, this sort of Bible study, and please forgive us, because I know some of you out there will be absolutely outraged at the fact we're not speaking scripture right through and through, but this is a very important, subject and I think knowing what we're eating uh, and how it affects us uh, can actually um, I suppose spoil our life as we know it even now we know the Lord is coming back and one day we'll have no sickness and death and we will everything will be uh, hunky-dory but you know what we do now uh, can help us uh, to live a better a better life and free from a lot of sickness you know some of the things and obviously we've got to be very careful here when we're talking about the treatments that people get for cancer um, but, you know, when you think about it, maybe a couple of hundred years ago, people's treatments of using leeches uh, for what are ailments, uh, would we look back, do you think, in years to come that chemotherapy was... We already are. Okay. We um, already are. And can I, can I just say that I actually get oncologists occasionally phoning me with their own cancer. And I say to them, why don't you do the chemotherapy and radiation and all the rest of it? And there's this long silence on the end of the phone and uh, they won't do it. Yeah. They won't do it. There was a study done in Canada where they polled a whole bunch of oncologists and they said, imagine you yourself had cancer. Which of these five treatments would you yourself take if you had it? And 70% of those who responded said they wouldn't take any of them. And the reason they gave was the unacceptable degree of toxicity. Yeah. And the bottom line is, if you think about this logically, how can you make people better by poisoning them? That's it. They had Maurice Saatchi on the Andrew Marr show yesterday just saying it's medieval because his... Yes. Um, his wife, was it Josephine, I've forgotten his wife's name, died of cancer. He said he would never recommend it. Well, I had that, I had that year when I lost a number of members of my family and they, and they went down with chemo. It was awful, mm. awful, and it will stay with me to my dying day. Yeah. Any emails that many, coming in? Right, many, let's many have, many have a look at the emails. God bless um, you. I'll just go through them, shall I? Mm. Um, Maureen writes, I went on tablets called uh, Calm for anxiety and they are all awful. Um, as I thought, being herbal, they would be better than prescription tablets had been. 
um, three days. I don't know what the argument is there, Maureen, because it's one long sentence, but um, th uh, something three days and feeling better. <laughs> God bless. Um, please ask Philip what I can eat for a fatty pancreas. It's given me trouble with bowel movement. I'm not diabetic, colon, normal, but I'm taking osteophosis, uh, osteophos, if, if you know what that means. Three sachet calcium every night. I assume it's a genuine email, yeah. but I, because it's out of my uh, league. Bon Viva, one tablet per month. Please help, Anne. I'll read a few more. Can you uh, please tell me why there are no pips in grapes? Joyce asks. Well, that's a good one, isn't it? Because they, they used to be, and there are still yeah. some, and yeah. there are very good reasons why we should have because the ones. A certain, a certain corporation is buying them out. So no more pips. Unless How you long will they last? <laughs> <laughs> no more pips until you pay up. Yeah. Um, no, this is really, I mean, these seed banks, this is very frightening as well because mm. you're seeing that, you know, I'm a farmer's boy and we always used to set back a certain amount of seed for the following year mm. and you go to America and you get into all kinds of trouble. You get the heavy mob coming around if you end up doing that now in America. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, yeah, it's really ugly. Shocking. But isn't there something in uh, particularly the grape uh, seeds that's not the seed itself but just around the seed mm. uh, that there is something that helps us to counter the toxicity that causes Platelets, cancer? I think something on the... Uh, you want to reduce the Oh, yeah. Well. I mean, grapes are absolutely phenomenal and have a, a massive antioxidant potential. We see um, the seeds in general. I mean, when you go from apricot kernels through to apple seeds, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Um, yeah, right the way through it. The pycnogenols, um, strong antioxidants. Um, these are all contained in, the, in these foods. They reckon there's about 10,000 phytonutrients in a tomato, most of which we've never even discovered, let alone put names to. And, you know, going back to my daughter Anna, she'll look at a jammy dodger and go, that's food for me. But when you look at a tomato, when you look at the incredible process by which the body makes cells, we don't know what's in those tomatoes. And yet, that goes towards the miracle of life in ways that we have absolutely no idea about and never will. Mm -hmm. uh, More? Tim? Um, it's Robin here. From the, for the past uh, two to three months, God was telling me to go back to dry fasting. And then I got a book, uh, The Fasting Prayer by Franklin Hall. Through this book, I come, came to know how much fasting is important. People got healed through, from cancer, through fasting from cancer, diabetes, and many more. Through regular fasting, people have long lives. I finished my 21 days last month, and God gave me strength to complete it. Now I understand we eat food to live, not live to eat. Thank God for revelation on fasting. That's from mm -hmm. Robin. That's something we, uh, actually Daniel also uh, gave us a oh, good yeah, example of. One day fast yeah. that he did when Gabriel mm. came. Yeah. Mm. So maybe we could look at those scriptures because mm. that's quite appropriate. Oh, I, um, I think we're looking at Daniel 9, is it? Uh, talking about it. Oh, also in chapter 10. Um, so let's have a look. Should yes. we look at. It carries on in 10, verse 3, which is from where we were. Uh, taking over from what Daniel uh, was experiencing earlier on in chapter 1. Do we have a look at that? On, oh, that's 10 verse 3. Yep, have a look. Do you want to uh, read that for us, Philip? Yes. It's on the screen. I ate no pleasant food, no meat or wine came into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all, till three whole weeks were fulfilled. Now the background to leading up to this, uh, it w do you want to just paraphrase it when Daniel was... Yeah, we were getting to the end of the Babylonian captivity, which Jeremiah had prophesied would last 70 years. You know what's fascinating about this is that Daniel sees, knows that this captivity is coming to an end. So rather than going out and partying, he, goes, he, he does a fast and he basically goes on his knees and prays. And it's a 21-day um, situation for him. And then when the angel turns up, it turns out that he's been fighting a battle for the same amount of time. So the implication is, of course, that as, as Daniel is fasting and praying, and the prayer is absolutely incredible. Perfect. And if you go through mm. Daniel chapter 9, even though you read it in the English, I mean, we haven't got time to go through it all now, but you can just hear him quaking and quivering. You know, I mean, the, the, yeah, he was quaking, the literally. The emotion is yeah. just a, absolutely incredible. And then... And then uh, Gabriel shows up, and then you get the 70 weeks prophecy, which to me has to be one of the most 
astounding prophecies in the entire Bible. Do you know that uh, when you get down to Daniel 9, 24 to 27, that if you extrapolate that prophecy, it predicts to the very day the triumphal entry. And Jesus held the Jews accountable to know the time of their visitation, which actually turns out to be the reason why Jerusalem is destroyed in 70 AD. There's many reasons you can ask historians about why Jerusalem got wiped out by Titus and those four legions in 70 AD. Jesus' answer was, because you knew not the time of your visitation. So he was holding them accountable to know Daniel 9, which got delivered by Gabriel while Daniel was fasting. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that incredible? Uh, And this is what, um, uh, what's his name? Um, The the guy who uh, discovered gravity, what's his name? Newton. Isaac Newton. So yeah. Isaac Newton yeah. uh, was fascinated yeah. with this particular uh, prophecy yeah. and worked out the numerics of it and Sir came Robert up with Anderson. the mid-20th, yeah, Sir Robert mid-21st Anderson century too. as Sir the coming of the Lord. Yeah. Sir Robert Anderson, who was, uh, ex, uh, he was head of Scotland Yard, did a whole thing, the coming prince, and when he extrapolated this particular prophecy as well. You know, what, you know what I find interesting on this whole thing as well is that you get a sense of what's going on behind the scenes because... Gabriel actually says, you know, I've been doing battle with the, what, the Prince of Persia and I'm off to fight the Prince of Greece. Well, that wasn't for another 150 years, right? Mm -hmm. So you get in, it's almost like, you you know, outside of the time domain, you've got these, this war going on in the metacosm, as it were, between... Mm -hmm. And he's also sort of projecting right through history as well, which is just amazing, right to our day. But I suppose there's several things that you can take from Daniel's account here is that, first of all, he went into prayer and fasting. Um, And I don't think we hear enough about fasting in our dietary expeditions, as it were. No, you don't. Uh, And yet it's done a lot outside of the Christian realm. Mm. Uh, You know, if you look at a lot of people like... um, uh, David Wolfe and others who, who are just absolute experts on nutrition in general, you know, they're all about the benefits of fasting. Um, we don't see it so much. It's, it's in the Christian um, world today. It's something that people will try. And if you're doing a long fast, you've really got to be knowledgeable and you've got to be prepared about it because, the, you know, there the can be problems. But um, there seems to be here with Daniel a way, a way in which you combine prayer with fasting that has amazing uh, and mm. almost mystical connotations. Because when we look at Christ going into the wilderness to fast for 40 days, 40 days is always in the Bible, the time of testing. And, um, you know, I find it absolutely astonishing um, because then when you read after that, because he's presented, John the Baptist, you know, introduces him, behold, um, the lamb that taketh away the sins of the world. And all the Jews would have known immediately that John was referring to the Passover lamb. So even back then, he's, he's presenting. Um, and I just, I just love that vision out of Bethabara where you've got, the, you know, you've got the, uh, uh, the Sanhedrin spies all there listening to what's going on, you know, as John's announcing this. And that's a, I've never been there, but that's a fair hike. Mm. And they didn't have Avis mm. back then. So you had all these <laughs> hundreds of people going out to Bethabara to hear John. Yeah. But no, coming back to the fasting combined with prayer, there's something, what, what do you think that's all about? Well, I, I think a detoxation of the spirit uh, as well as the, the body. You know, you, you, I find, uh, not that I'm a great faster, but when I have fasted, especially for longer periods of time, is that it, it, you get to a, pe- a, a place where you actually you have no need of food and a clarity of mind and know how to be, if you like, closer to God. Mm-hmm. In, is, is that possible, you might say? But mm-hmm. I've you always, are. I found it a very spiritual experience yeah. where after a week or so, the body, like you say, shuts down almost. And uh, the, the tough bit is the first three, four days. I've, uh, yeah, have, or have up you, to the yeah, seventh I've day. Done 21, actually. You've done it. Yeah. I've not done the 21, yeah, but, yeah. but I yeah. was a student then. Yeah. And I just memorized scriptures during that time. Well, no need to memorize anything because there's only a few seconds left. And that's just about the fish, life of a fish or the memory of. Uh, so now we're going to uh, close this particular uh, side of, of uh, our particular Bible study with Philip Day and Tim Vince. But do stay tuned because we're going to be coming to you live only after this good evening of Monday to go with The Late Show, taking your phone calls and more questions, etc. So thank you very much for being with us on this Bible study. God bless you. Do get into the Word of God. I'd just love you to know what God has in store for us. Take care.